Hey there, folks, and welcome to the first English edition of the Bait Podcast. I'm Zayori, your host, and I'm going to be joined regularly by none other than Bait's captain, the man, Dendi. Dendi, how are you, buddy? Hello. I'm great. Thank you. I'm really happy to be here and do this stuff in English so more people can hear the thoughts and stuff like this. Likewise, happy to be here. I couldn't be more excited, my friend. Uh, we're going to focus on a lot of different stuff on this show, but mostly competitive content. Uh, for the first one, we're going to talk a little team history. We're going to talk about what it's like to be a captain, how you find the balance that you need to be a good captain, a good mid laner, a good coach, maybe even at times a good manager. Uh, and then we're going to talk about that last series from ESL Los Angeles against Virtus Pro. It was a 2 1 series, it was a fun one to watch. Uh, we're going to break that down in a little more detail. So um, one of the first things that we need to get out of the way, of course, sponsored by Rivalry.com. You can register a free account today, 100% deposit bonus up to $100. Rivalrybait.com for a nice quick link. Check them out. Please support them. It would make us happy. Um, given this is our first show, I wanted to talk about Excalibur specifically, the new carry player. Uh, I think most folks by now are aware of some of the backstory behind Cumin and Pio 65, thanks to the video that you put out explaining it. Um, I was looking back and it was sort of interesting how Excalibur had a similar breakthrough into the competitive scene back at the first summit in 2014. You and I were both there, Dendi. Fnatic was playing. Yeah, they had I remember. Yeah, Excalibur is a stand-in because uh, Era was having some issues at the time. They needed somebody last second. They looked at the ladder and went, oh, wow, Excalibur, he's number one. How bad could he be? And that was sort of what um, you know, brought him into the limelight. Was it similar for Pio 65? Like, how did you guys discover this guy? Um, it it's actually was really tough with uh, Pio 65 at uh, the time we were at boot camp. And, you know, we had a lot of discussion. I was trying to build up it for some time. Like, we were searching for a carry player uh, before New Year. Then uh, we already, like, set everything going with Kuman. We were about, like, that practice come to bootcamp, everything was organized, you fly from different countries, different cities. We came to bootcamp and suddenly, like, uh, after a few days of practice, which was actually going well, uh, Kuman was snitched by VP, which was very <laughs> rough, because actually, on my experience, this never happened to me before. I think we had some uh, situations like this at other places. I think uh, Rezo was in situation before if i'm not mistaken maybe someone else but uh, the guy like getting taken out from you right from boot camp yeah oh so it was it was it was really tough so we were in very rush we were like situation where we need to find the carry and it was like not so much time left before a qualifier so all players were already like set up different teams mm -hmm. we were searching the Luckily, we found Pio, who was free at the time. He agreed like, to arrive next day. He was from Belarusia. He traveled from Minsk to Moscow, like, from another country. And uh, we got him next day and started practicing. That's the story about Pio. Yeah. So we didn't really have a chance like look through different players to test them out or anything like this. It was very urgent in a way. Yeah, yeah, right. It's uh, one of the biggest qualifications for that job was, can you be here tomorrow? <laughs> so. Yeah, exactly. Because if we would not find a player, this could actually happen. Like, uh, he would probably go back home. Like, we will not be able to play. And when this all this boot camp and preparation, right. the start of a team and everything would go like hard spot. Uh, we were looking to players from U and CIS. I was talking Ace, and we were searching for like different options. Yeah, but in the end, well, the big issue as well was was that there weren't. This was right before qualifiers, so it's not like there were all these free agents looking for teams. Like most of the stacks had already been kind of created. Most most people were also boot camping for the very same event you guys wanted to play in. So you even mentioned in the video, really one of your only other options was to break up a team or poach somebody, and that would just continue the cycle of what had happened to you. So, it, I mean, it's, it's good that you were able to find someone that uh, didn't involve breaking up another team that also wanted to play. Yeah, absolutely. And you no, know, there is like, in CIS, uh, two sand is pretty rough. There is a lot of teams, a lot of strong stacks, and lots of teams actually bootcamp. Same amount, like, maybe, I don't know, 
teams or even more i feel like we having some boot camps mm -hmm. and uh, yeah so it was not not simple task for us find a player yeah absolutely so pio stuck around for a couple of months i think we announced the roster in early february uh it's april 17th i think excalibur has been officially on the team now for what three weeks maybe almost a month um Three weeks, yeah. yeah. Uh, let me check. Yeah, it may, yeah, around around three weeks, something like that. So, how how did you come about um, acquiring Excalibur? Was he always somebody on your radar? Did somebody give you a tip? Did he reach out to you? How did this relationship come about? Um, I realized that uh, there was some troubles with uh, Team Singularity. I think but, uh, I wanted to, like we were already start we already started searches. On a carry player because we were not uh, satisfied with what was going on like i'm not blaming it all on pure or something but uh, we definitely had uh, we we needed to do some change and uh, yeah i guess we all agreed that it would be better for all of us and even pure that we make a change like this so i started to search for carry players i tried to search not only from cas region but all other regions mm -hmm. and we actually, uh, yeah, like that, that's how we came out Thief. And yeah, I mean, uh, so far, like, I'm happy because, as you said, it was a long run. It was 2014, first time we met, like, together on uh, LAN. But that time, like, Steve really impressed me. Yeah. He was playing insane Tinker, I think. It was like 1v5. Uh, you know, all, all team would play for him, make him farm, like, fast travel, Dagon, Blink Dagger, like, 14 yeah. minutes and when he would destroy everyone i still remember those games it was crazy after that uh lots of jungle nerves and tinker nerves were coming out so <laughs> you can't do it again you know like mush machines don't farm mansions anymore and stuff like this yeah uh, no uh, i i can still picture that really iconic moment i forget who they were playing against but it was fanatic's first win at the event i think maybe it was the match against dk the, yeah the, like, against dk the chinese super stack then it was burning mushi ice 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 lanum and mmy that is a crazy team um and i remember him jumping into trixie or no tail jumping into trixie's lap right afterwards and steve just kind of sitting there like yeah we did it I don't, I'm not part of the team, but woo, you know, that's sort of awkward. Everyone else is jumping all over each other, and you could tell he still wasn't like comfortable with them yet on a, a human level. Uh, it was really interesting to see him open up throughout that event, and he's been grinding ever since. I mean, if you look back at that dude's play, uh, team history, Excalibur is, he's like rivaling Demon for the amount of different teams that he's been on. When you were scouting players, did you look at this as a positive or a negative or or kind of a neutral? Because he he's had the chance to play with a lot of different teammates over the years. Uh, I think he was gaining experience all this time, so he was definitely. I I, I still think it's definitely a good thing. I was searching for a player who is willing to work hard, who is uh, like stable mind, you know, and uh, intelligent, and I think just perfectly fits that he's a very high skilled player he's still a young player if you look at him uh with at 2014 i don't know how, how old he was like seven yeah seven? he's he's 22 now so yeah he, yeah, he, he was he, really young like i think he took like a little sabbatical from his high school or whatever it was to be able to do that because he also attended ti with fanatic in 2014 not as a player because that was the whole drama where Era was kind of forced to play with the squad because that was the team that qualified. But Excalibur was there technically as their coach. I don't know how much coaching he actually did, but I remember hanging out with him in the uh, the meal room and chit chatting in between pubs. Yeah, even at TI, I remember like uh, Fly was playing a lot of Tinker, and we were discussing some uh, Tinker strategies on how to play the hero and stuff because he had Steve, you know, like <laughs> provide him a lot of information. Yeah, I mean, through through this year, Steve definitely improved a lot. I believe the player and the person grew up, he measured. So, like, I'm actually lucky that I'm playing with him right now, like, I believe. I'm glad to hear that. He's one of the players ever... Maybe I'm biased because the Summit was such a, such a special event to me because I was working with Beyond the Summit back then, and that was 
so much effort went into making that event happen and seeing this player that none of us had heard of before that tournament showing up and having a few moments and doing some interviews and stuff has always been burned in my memory and i've always wanted him to see him do well and i've always told people don't sleep on this guy just wait until he gets into a, a solid team with a stable training regimen and a good captain and eventually this guy will be able to fly into the tier one and uh i'm i'm I've been calling that for a couple of years now, so I'm hoping this is finally Steve's time to shine. Yeah, I, I hope uh, that we grow to the level uh, so we don't fail of expectations. Yeah. Because right now we are working really hard. Like last weeks we were really, really rough, like really insane, like hard working, playing very good teams. Uh, there is new patch. Like we just all the time, like we talking about Dota, we practicing, we watching games we discussing we preparing like it's all the process apparently results are not as we expecting <laughs> and obviously probably uh, yeah lots of people who cheer to watch our games probably not really happy many times disappointed but i i assure you that we are trying our best we are definitely working on our mistakes and trying to um, play better and we are learning a lot mm -hmm. the last two weeks we we're insanely well, with all these Productive. online leagues, this is definitely a good time to do some learning. Um, is it is it hard to bring in a new player? When So the four of you have already been playing for a little while, and now you've brought in Steve as this fifth addition to replace Pio. What, what's it like adjusting to a new player like that? Is, is it hard to integrate him to your existing sort of social circle that uh, must exist? Oh, from my Dota experience, it can go both ways. Sometimes it takes, like, not big amount of time. Sometimes it's months. Sometimes it's more than month. Sometimes it's uh, stick stuck like instantly, and you start giving results. But right now, I feel like last patch was pretty big. Changed a lot in Dota, different ways. Like uh, comeback system was a little bit touched, and uh, a lot of things changed it in a way. So I feel like it's all over again. You no, know? it's like we start again for our team. <laughs> to build everything from scratch yeah it's like an mmr reset yeah interesting and you mentioned all the hard work um how do you guys find balance right because i've talked to some other teams that have mentioned that practice isn't necessarily a function of raw hours and there's like a sweet spot where you want to practice during your prime hours every day but you know practicing 12 hours a day does has diminishing returns after a certain point how do you guys find that balance between like training actual scrims, replay analysis, and then also just time off? Honestly, uh, because of quarantine and we are sitting home, we don't really have too much time off. And I feel like we all sit repeat most of the time. And I, actually, I think we are not finding the balance right now. <laughs> we are a li little bit getting like overburned in a way mm. like, because it's uh, much almost every day official when you need to prepare and when you need to analyze and when you need to improve and when you practice something new when uh, like there is a lot of talks going so we are constantly in this process like 27 and i feel it's not very healthy like mentally especially when you're not giving results like if you're losing it's actually a little bit hurts you mm. in a way like it's getting hard you no know? uh but uh i'm pretty sure i'm pretty confident we can we can make it i hope so like yeah we are working hard yeah, it, it definitely ebbs and flows. I can imagine the beginning is probably busier right now than maybe the goal is, uh, you know, long term once there's more balance. But yeah, I mean, sorry to not no. interrupt. If you want to get to like tier one level, right, then you definitely catch up because those guys know much more than we do. So we have insane amount of knowledge we need to get somewhere from. So we keep researching, we keep digging this knowledge somewhere you know we keep mm -hmm. discussing we keep analyzing what we are doing wrong what we can do differently what our team's doing right what we can take from them and all those kind of stuff like uh, there's a lot of things going and it's not so easy to see or understand for viewers so for viewers it's mostly black and white but <laughs> it's uh, much more colorful inside when it I'm sure. Yeah. And obviously everything going on with the the pandemic and the quarantine around the world is, is just making it even harder because I, I know Excalibur is in Sweden and he's been playing with you guys remotely. I, I, all of you have also been playing remotely from your individual homes, right? There's been no like boot camp or physical training facility because everyone's on lockdown. Correct? 
Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So that, that makes it like these are this is prime bonding time when it would be so awesome to have all five of you in the same place and you can actually, you know, work in person and instead everybody's stuck at home staring at the white walls. <laughs> it's yeah, that's the, the story. Right before yeah. current we were about to go to bootcamp, we were already planning everything and stuff like this. So uh and then suddenly like everything locked down, so stuck yeah. at home. It's uh it's a rough time. Um so let's talk about ESL Los Angeles a little bit. Um, all online now. Europe CIS has been the big region with all the eyeballs on it. Uh, two groups of eight, I think 16 teams across CIS uh, and EU competing together. Uh, we didn't have the best run. I, I think we ended uh, bottom of our group, actually. We uh, did take a series. Was it against Hellraisers? I think that was the series that we won and looked pretty good. That was a couple weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, but most recently it was Virtus Pro. I was glad that it went to three games. That was one of my uh, the, the the key hallmarks that I was looking for. But I was shocked at how short the games were. Like that whole series looked like the same formula for every game, where one team got ahead and then they won in less than thirty minutes. It was it was a pretty quick series, actually. Um, yeah, for for this tournament, we actually learned a lot. We were we fighting against like uh, best teams of both. Regions obviously and we're trying to like we are a new team so we were trying to get uh, to get the shot like going you know we were trying to show some results we were trying to uh, fight but we because we are so fresh uh, we actually throw a lot of games I believe I felt like uh, we could uh, give better results for example against Cyber Legacy I think we could win uh, second series we could have 2-1 Against OG, also we were leading the third game. I believe we could finish this game and also win. So we were, we were like giving away some games. Some games were very disappointed. Also, like Nigma, for example. Actually, against Nigma, second game we also like kind of rolled. Yeah, and then against um, uh, who, who else did we play? I think OG. I think that series went three games as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So against VP, I think um, it. it of course, we're a very strong team, but we were very like trying to prepare very well to them. Like we were uh, spending a lot of time on what we're gonna do, what we wanna do against them, and stuff like this. Like something that can fit us. So first game, maybe we were testing a little bit the stuff like uh, that we wanted to test with Enigma and Patch. Didn't work really well for them, and we had heroes that we wanted, like close them up. Yeah, yeah, that all the lanes and. Yeah, I've heard a lot of negative things about Pudge recently. Um, one of the specific questions I had about this series, you guys, you banned Techie's first phase every game. Is is that specific against VP or is Techie is Techie's viable right now? I guess I didn't. I must have missed some matches to <laughs> realize that Techie's was a, a serious threat right now. Well, Techie's, you know, is uh, this kind of hero that you don't really want to play with, and you don't want to pr really play against it in <laughs> matchmaking. But in official game, of course, it's different. But still, if you know that some team playing it well or give some good results with it, which VP did, they won like two or three games with Techie's recent this mm -hmm. tournament. So we didn't really want to play against it. We kind of think we know how to play against it, like we know what to do in a way. But at the same time. It will just completely change the game flow. So we, that's that was the reason we kind of get rid of it and just go with other heroes. Mm, yeah, I see. I'm curious what you think about the current meta right now, because from what I've been watching and also just anecdotally from pub games that I've seen, it feels like we're almost getting back to a death ball meta. You know, like lanes still matter, but what really matters are those those early team fights. That ten to twenty minute window just seems so delicate in most Dota games right now. You win that fifteen minute fight, and you're set up pretty well for the rest of the game. Is that true? Do you, do you feel like we're going back to the death ball? Yeah, I definitely feel so. And the reason is pretty simple. I feel like. Uh... After formal a good patch, you know, usually that patch come out, uh, one patch or another, or this small patch or that small patch or bigger patch. If they don't, if they don't touch uh, experience or gold formulas in a way, those patches are not so big. They are big, which heroes, they can change map, like something can change like in the game in a way. But the biggest patches is when formula is touched. So last patch, big one, like formula was touched, the way that comeback system 
much less right now in mm -hmm. some directions. And like gold and XP formula changed it a bit, right? So after that, game changed it completely in some way. Yeah. Then they also touch heroes. So balanced jump from head to legs, you know, from legs to head. Yeah. All, all over. And from this point, yeah, I feel like uh, one of the main things is lanes are insanely important right now. Uh, obviously, drafts like uh, drafts can say a lot about where the game going, like from the early beginning. But yeah, uh, and from lanes, if you have good lanes, you can take over control of the game, and it's much harder for enemy to come back. There is much less uh, situations where those comeback uh, uh, heroes or comeback strategies yeah. can work than before, and also like. Changed in a way that even items that you're buying now on the heroes and heroes that you rate now, like uh, also different. Like I can give an example. For example, when I played Queen of Pain uh, before, I would buy Orchid first item in most of the games mm -hmm. because uh, the game would get delayed, comeback would work, and then suddenly after uh, I would hit a good Orchid timing through stuff like this. But now I feel like this item co-op. You don't want to buy. You want to buy an uh, item that fight early. You don't die. You don't want to die on your heroes yeah. more. You don't want to exchange those deaths. So you buy L or something like it's like first item. Uh, I even thought, yeah, maybe heroes like Storm Spirit will come up to idea where they buy BKB first item. Maybe we've got stuff like this just so they can fight early. So they, mm. you don't buy these middle items more because you don't really aim to go through comeback mechanics not aim late game. you aim to this early mid game where you snowball and take over control and controlling the map and then it's much harder to come back of course there is some comeback like for example we played against Soji we had gyro who going axe in like uh, rapier and satanic <laughs> uh, uh, he, he have entire team behind buffing with solar crest auto swords and all our body Right. Stuff like that. Yeah, so, but when there is not so many of those, like, yeah, it's, uh, it's strategy, it's much in, less. It's interesting that there's, uh, like actual rapier timings that you can hit now with how, how good that item feels on heroes like Gyrocopter. So I, I see what you mean, but that does make a lot of sense. Um, it's so much about maintaining that early momentum and buying items that just keep you alive rather than the kind of old school high risk, high reward. Yeah, I got a trade. You get punished yeah. a lot more for that now, it seems. And that's why draft is even more important now than... Well, it was still super important last patches. Like it, It's like draft can uh, you, I don't know, 60, 70% uh, like... It, it's how important it is for like 70% mm -hmm. of the game is kind of draft. Right. And uh, it's also pretty hard to draft in a way. Until you know everything because of new patch, what is good against what, the synergy between heroes, the, uh, the heroes who are countering what heroes, like and uh, many, many, many other things. And then even if you draft good heroes, like you're pretty sure your heroes are good, your team also need to know how to use those heroes, right. how to play together and stuff <laughs> like it. So often people say like, oh, like this player have like a small hero pool, but it's often not even about player hero pool, but play around with hero so it's basically like uh, the entire team you know how to play with certain hero uh, and then we still gonna like play well yeah because if we don't then we're not gonna work out right um so along the same lines here they've reduced the rubber band mechanic but they they tried to compensate for it with the streak shutdown bonus so now if you end like a carries yeah. 5-0 streak or 7-0 streak the rewards are insane, both in gold and experience. I've, I've definitely seen some of the pro players uh, complain about this on Twitter and that this doesn't feel uh, the way that it should. How do you feel about it? Is, is this a, a good way to take Dota? Are streak shutdowns the future, or do you think they're going to change it back? I don't know how we're going to change it, but I don't think we're changing it back. I actually like it in a way because Dota, what I didn't, really like what's going on with Dota, but uh, it didn't reward skill on a high level. Like, I feel like uh, Dota should be more skill-rewarding game, so the players will enjoy playing 
more like in a way you know? mm-hmm. like uh, and this is what uh, what i really loved about dota is when well, dota was about outsmarting outplaying player where you feel rewarded if you outplay your enemy you know anyway if you are playing it uh out micring out skilling whatever like you get rewarded and you feel good because actually your time that you spend in the game pays off Oh, you know, in a way. Yeah. And uh, so I feel like this Strix thing is not bad because uh, you can just play smart around it. I see. You need to rate your life higher if you're core or if you support, you play a little bit differently. I don't think it's bad. It's just a little bit another style in a way. Yeah, it definitely encourages the, quote, perfect gameplay mentality. And I, I think it, it gets harder the stronger you get. You know, as you get more fed, if you're 10 and 0, you feel like God as you run in there, you're unkillable. And that's those are the kind of things now that get punished very hard compared to before. So I, I'm, I, I feel like I need to see more data. Um, it feels normal, except for those few scenarios where like your off lanes feeding the enemy carries really farmed and then your carry rotates and shuts down the other carry all of a sudden your anti-mage gets three levels a thousand gold it has these weird moments where you go huh did he really deserve all that just because he had a nice mana void <laughs> you know like it's yeah it, well it's uh, still i guess part of the game another yeah. thing that i like i think we change if i'm not mistaken uh, mistaken um the formula did last patch that if you're killing a support who is bottom one net worth still takes in consideration team net worth of uh, of his team so if his team net worth is higher than your team net worth uh, you get much more gold for killing in those bottom bottom net worth support no and i think it wasn't really fair in a way uh, in my opinion it's, it's, it wasn't good Definitely rough for all the position fives out there, for sure. Um, what are your current thoughts about Void Spirit? Uh, specifically, I, I'm curious because I saw that you played it in game two against Virtus Pro um, against the Storm Spirit. And in that matchup, they had picked the Storm Spirit fourth, and I think you picked the uh, Void Spirit yeah. fifth. So I'm twofold curious. One, is Void Spirit, uh, quote, a counter to Storm Spirit? And then two, overall, do you feel like Void Spirit's in a good good place? Is he overpowered, underpowered? What's your take? Uh, I think Void Spirit is an amazing hero. It's uh, actually mostly early mid game hero in a way, uh, but later if you get Axe, it provides a lot for team fight. So he adds up a lot of burst, very strong laner, and I think he's one of the best heroes against those uh, other spirits like Storm, Ember, Air Spirit, and all the jumping heroes because if he buy elves, catch those guys, and only one thing can save you from this is either you have a safe in team or you have BKB or you have Lincoln's Fair, which are very expensive items and L is pretty cheap. And with Spirit is very strong laner, so he can get this L pretty fast. And when he set up those guys like Storm Spirit, get those kills pretty for your team. He's an amazing hero. And they had like AA, and F- which I think with Spirit also amazing against. And they had Mars, and I think with Spirit is pretty good against Mars. So basically, oh, yeah. West Spirit was a pretty good pickware, and I think if the game goes uh, the right way, like our way, if it's going well, and I buy fast L, and then uh, even if you go even with them, like maybe in, at 25 minutes I get Axe, it's double silence, yeah, the shield, so it's pretty good against Storm Spirit. It's pretty hard to play Storm Spirit, I believe. Yeah, it. Just watching that game, it seemed like you were doing fine until the rotation started coming in. And then the battles over runes is always where things start to get hinky. It's not a skill matchup yeah. anymore, and it becomes uh, what rune spawns, who rotates, who gets the jump, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, we uh, actually failed on uh, side lanes. We could do much better bottom, we could do better top. And because top was not going well, I think Snap uh, couldn't really rotate uh, towards the rune. Even felt like I said that four minute rune will be important. 3.30 or something, like I warned my team. And uh, so uh, Shadow Demon came to help me, but Snap couldn't, and I didn't get in for about Phoenix, so I died, Storm got haste, and then the game got really rough from that point. Uh, the snowball started happening from them. Like Storm Spirit bottom, bound, Shadow Demon, Master Team base, then 
from that point, our all our lanes were already not going well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's <laughs> that's going to be tough in any game, regardless of draft. Um, but yeah, I I just keep going back to this death mall meta. It's it seems like yeah, but these... uh, about stone spirit was yeah. it's kind of gotcha. in my opinion. Okay, that's that's good to know. I'm always curious about these mid matchups, and uh, you know, it's not always about draft because you can see these matchups where an analyst will say, "Oh, this hero should win every time." But uh, sometimes skill has a pretty big factor. Yeah, I there can tell also. you a little secret that uh, mostly mid wave decided a lot on creep block oh. and on first two creep waves because first two creep waves is was very important because of consumables nowadays that you bring like flask and mangoes and stuff like this. So basically, if if you get all four Vaskets, first four creeps, you get level, right? Mm -hmm. And then any deny can already break it. Then if on first two waves, deny of us hit like uh, a lot of creeps compared to your enemy. Even let's say matchup is equal, but then you are unlucky with one last hit, unlucky with second last hit, or he is more lucky, or something like that happens. Then suddenly you already can't bring yourself like uh, no plus fast, but you only bring fast. Mm. He bring you himself no plus fast plus mango because he got more last hits, and then he's getting level three faster already. When the snowball comes out from there. So that's where like equal matchups can uh, break or even unequal matchups. Okay. First two creep waves are super important. Block of yeah. also. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. It's all about the early momentum and then getting those early items gives you more regen so you can spam more spells. And as you get further ahead, it's easier to get more ahead based on that. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, for, about block, like there is so many do with block and so also depends on lineup sometimes you can get uh, you can let your creeps on enemy tower just uh, to cancel some of his last hits and stuff like this sometimes you can try to block it as hard as possible to get a high ground upper hand so he have misses if you range sometimes you want it middle on some heroes like it's very different and uh, yeah a lot of things a lot of mind games going uh, those yeah. minutes and it's very interesting, I think, also. like I wish I can share more on those because I feel like this is a very interesting topic to talk about for people to understand okay. how, how deep Dota game is like those moments. Yeah, no, that's a good idea for maybe a future episode or two, though. Really hone in like on specific matchups or specific mid-mechanics. Um, that, that, would, that would be pretty cool. I'm sure a lot of people would appreciate learning through that. Um, one of the last uh, big questions I had before we kind of wrap things up here was um, when it comes to drafting right now, given that you know we have this death ball type meta, do you, do you feel like you need to pick a hero that can push uh, when you win fights? Like I think Pugna and DK are kind of my two big ones. You win this 15 minute fight with DK. Okay, let's take a tier two. Oh, okay, let's go high ground. It, do you sort of have to draft a hero like that that can punish? Uh, Lycan, another good example. Yeah, I mean, if you look at stats, I believe you will see that most of those heroes have higher win rate compared to other heroes, and there is a reason for that, obviously. When you're drafting, you usually want to have, like, balanced draft. You want to have everything. You want to have magic damage, physical damage, disables, like, uh, you want to have good team fight. you want to have strong lanes, so you aim to have everything balanced in a way, and of course, like, tower damage is one of the most important things, too, because can make your game just simpler because if you have tower damage you kill the guys on tower you instantly break tower but if you don't have tower damage you already depend on timings where catapulta is going or you you can get delayed much longer 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 and then the game go later and then enemy who were losing might turn it around like they will have more chance because with more items it's easier to come back mm. as later the game goes so of course, tower right. damage is very important. Right. Okay. All right. Um, well, that's that's everything I had on my list for this first episode. Uh, our goal with these is to keep it a little bit shorter. We want to do about 30-minute episodes so they're nice and digestible and targeted around current events, recent matches that the team's played in. Uh, Dendi, it was an absolute pleasure for this first episode. Uh, anything else you want to add before we close here? Oh, thank you, Andrew. I really appreciate it. It was a pleasure for me, too. I wanted to say... But uh, I hope that it, it was in for people to listen. I want uh, you guys to ask more questions maybe and stuff like this. So we will have like 
more topics to talk about next time to answer some of your questions and stuff like this yeah i think it would be amazing yeah. like i would love to share uh, some insights and stuff for everyone so we can, we can discuss some stuff with you andrew and yeah, would be cool. no, absolutely. Hopefully I can take the role of the average Dota player so that, um, you know, I can learn. Oh, come on, them. come on. Don't say <laughs> this. I know you're not average Dota player. You're insane. Oh, you're, you're too nice, my friend. Um, but no, I, I echo that as well, folks. Uh, communicate with us. YouTube comments on Twitter um, at bait esports GG uh, at Dendy boss at Zyori TV. Any of those uh, tweet feedback, questions, comments, and we'll be happy to uh, integrate it into future episodes. Uh, would love to have the, the community involved with this as much as possible. And we'll be making progressive updates here, overlays, content, production quality, all that stuff. This is number one and a lot more coming in the future. So stay tuned to all the bait social media channels. Keep watching the games and pretty soon we'll be putting up those results you've been waiting for. Yeah, cheer for us, guys. Love you. <laughs>